Good morning, my dear friends. As we gather this morning for worship, let us ask the Lord to open the eyes of our heart so that we might truly see him this morning. worship service. It is so good to be out here in God's side yard. What a beautiful day he has given us. I tell you, I was worried yesterday. It was a little bit of rain and a whole lot of heat and humidity. And I woke up this morning and God says, look, I've got this. You just go and be with me and worship. And I am so glad that I am. And I'm so glad that each and every one of you are here. Like I say every week, would not be the same without each and every one of you. So if you are here for the first time, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and embarrass yourselves, but we just, just know that we're glad you're here. And if you're here for the thousands time, you we're glad you're here as well. I'd like to invite you this morning, dear folks, to uh, open up your bulletins and join me as we read together our responsive call to worship. When the darkness around us is as dark as pitch. You ignite, you ignite the, the pitch, pitch to, to bring, bring us light. light. When we wail our song of sorrow. You, you turn, turn the, the notes to a song of praise. praise. When we are burdened under the weight of evil. You give, you us, give us strength to rise and, and power, power to prevail. prevail. Dear friends, when we are victims of evil intent or circumstances, only God can redeem the pain and sorrow, for He alone is faithful. Join us this morning as we lift up our voice and sing our opening hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs>
friends, as we seek to understand the Lord, we can truly find Him in His Word. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Matthew, beginning in the 18th chapter, 21st verse. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and join me there, because remember, as I proved for the last two Sundays in a row, I am prone to mistakes, and I might read the Scripture wrong, so read it for yourself and make sure that I'm saying exactly what God wants to be said. So, Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow, fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. My dear friends, this is the word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. My friends, when we hear God's word, our hearts sing with praise and our lips respond to him. Join me this morning for our responsive Psalter reading, which is found in your bulletin. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord who has triumphed gloriously, the horse and its rider, the horse is thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. This is my God whom I will praise. I will exalt my father's God who is a mighty warrior whose name is the Lord. The floods cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, terrible in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand, the earth swallows you. In your steadfast love, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Then Miriam, the prophet, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and dancing, and Miriam sang to them. Sing to the Lord, who has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, the Lord has thrown into the sea. Amen and amen. Y'all, you ready?
Dear friends, before we go to God's Word, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most wonderful and gracious Heavenly Father, once again, you have called us into your mighty presence. And God, we are so grateful to be here this morning. For Lord, it is good with everything that is going on in the world today to be able to take a break from all the evil and the trials of this world and have peace to be here to praise your mighty name. God, it is only by the power of the Spirit that we have the strength to praise you when we are beset by all the evils of this world. So this morning, God, we just invite you in. Even though you were here before us preparing this place and preparing our hearts, we invite you to pour out the Holy Spirit on us anew. Give us a fresh outpouring, Lord, that our hearts might be quickened this morning as we hear your word. And Lord, not only to be hearers of the word, but that spirit would touch us twice so that after we hear it, we would go out into the world to be a beacon of your hope, to be doers and not mere hearers of the word. So God, this morning, we just give you all the thanks, all the honor and the glory. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us this morning. And we thank you so much as we pray to you that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples so long ago saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, sometimes we cannot fathom the depths of evil that we see or that we are asked to endure. We cannot possibly understand how any of it makes any sense or how any of it can be redeemed. Today's Bible readings gives us believers a glimpse into what the world can become when God transforms evil into good. I want you to hear with me the Word of God this morning. It comes to us from the book of Genesis, the 50th chapter, the last chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning in verse 15, where we hear these words. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to Joseph, he wept. His brothers came to him, and, he threw, and they threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. My friends, this is the word of God this morning for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I wish that I could stand up here and take for granted that all of you know the backstory to that particular text and you know the story of Joseph. But I think I'd be a fool as a pastor to do that. So I just want to fill in a few blanks for you this morning to kind of let you know how Joseph got to where he's at, where his brothers are begging him for mercy after their father has died. You see, way back when, Joseph was just a snot-nosed little brat. He was the second to the youngest of 12 boys. But yet he had the audacity when he had these crazy dreams to come before his brothers and say, let me tell you what these dreams mean. These dreams mean I'm going to be the boss of y'all. And they said, oh, no, you're not. And they plotted to kill him. You see, he was his father's favorite, and they knew it. 
And then the audacity of Joseph to come and tell him that he would one day rule over him was too much for them to bear. So they plotted to kill him. And then one of his brothers says, why should we kill him? We don't gain anything by killing him. He says, uh, let's throw him in a well. And then when these traders come by, let's sell him as a slave. At least we'll get a little money out of the deal. We'll still be rid of the brat. And so through almost no fault of his own. I'm going to take a little different road than most preachers. Most preachers will say that, that he didn't have that come. And I say, as the oldest child, which I am, that if my younger brother had come to me and said he was going to be my boss, I'd have probably thrown him in a well too. So he probably had it coming, but in God's economy, in God's eyes, it was uncalled for. It was something that, that, that he had suffered at his brother's hands that he shouldn't have. And then he gets taken down into Egypt and he's sold to a guy named Potiphar. And he proves his work to Potiphar. And Potiphar puts him in charge of all of his belongings, his household, his fields, everything. But Potiphar's wife saw him and says, that's a fine looking young man right there. I think I want to spend a little time with him. And Joseph says, hold on now. You're my boss's wife, and I ain't going to play around with you. And when he refused to sleep with her, she made up a bunch of lies and said that he was the one that had attacked her. And then Joseph is thrown into prison for no good reason. And if that wasn't bad enough, when he's down in prison, there are two of Pharaoh's officials down there that have dreams that, that disturb him. They don't know what the dreams mean. And Joseph interprets those dreams for him and says, you're going to get out of prison here soon. Now, one of you, not going to go so well. Pharaoh's going to chop off your head and put your, your body up on a pole. But for the other one, the cupbearer, you're going to be restored to your position. And Pharaoh's going to make you a, a part of his trusted circle again. Do me a favor, since I've done this for you, make sure you tell Pharaoh about me, about how I'm stuck in this prison and I'm not supposed to be. And then the cupbearer got restored, and what do you think he did? He forgot all about Joseph. So time after time after time, Joseph gets the raw end of the deal. Evil befalls Joseph at every turn. In the end, God is able to take everything that happens to Joseph and turn it into good. Now, I want to just take a few minutes this morning, and I want to dispel some myths that a lot of Christians have about God and about evil. And not only Christians, most of the secular world have these as well. There is a huge difference, my friend, between God causing evil and God using evil. I mean, how many times have you heard it, or maybe you've uttered this before? I know I have. Well, if God is so good... Why would he let bad things happen? Or if God is all-powerful, why does he do evil things? My friends, there is a huge difference. God does not cause evil. We have this terrible habit of blaming God for it, but I'm here to tell you that evil is not a construct of God's. If you go back in your Bible to the third chapter of the book of Genesis, evil came about because humans brought it into creation. Now, those of you that know the Genesis 3 story about the forbidden fruit, we call it an apple, but the Bible doesn't ever call it that. You'd be saying, wait a second, pastor. How can it be, how can it be humans that did it? Wasn't it Satan that enticed them? You see, we also have a bad habit of blaming Satan. When we move beyond blaming God for evil, the next logical choice is, oh, it's the evil one. Satan's done it all. Satan, Satan. Evil is not a construct of Satan either. If you really think about it, did Satan take Eve's hand and place it on the fruit? Did Satan take that fruit and shove it in Adam's mouth? No. Satan merely exploited what was already in their hearts to begin with, which was a natural inclination to go against the good rules that God had set down for them. So even though God doesn't cause evil, and even though Satan will turn evil against us, here's the deal about God. God doesn't cause evil, but in all of his divine majesty, God can take anything evil and turn it into a good. As I stand before you this morning, I would just about bet every last dollar that I have in my wallet that every single one of us here today 
has had evil or some tragedy that has impacted our life. Would that be a safe bet? Would anybody care to come up and try to take my money from me by saying that I'm wrong on that? Evil or tragedy has touched every one of our lives. And often we are touched by both evil and tragedy. And at first, when it comes creeping into our lives, we don't see the redemption through the pain that we're suffering through. When you lose a loved one, you can't see how that can possibly turn into something good in your life. When somebody does you wrong, when you're fired unjustly, you possibly, you cannot possibly see how God will use that to grow you as a person and as a Christian. But for those of us that have had tragedy and evil strike in our lives, and it's been a little further back, with a little bit of time, most of us will agree that we can look back and see how it contributed positively to some aspect of our life. Is that agreeable? Can I get an amen if we can agree to that? All right, I hear a couple of amens. So not everybody's got enough time that they can look back and say, oh yeah, I can see where that was good. But I promise you, with enough time, you can look back and you say, I, I can see where God was working in and through that experience in my life. And you know why? Friends, it's because God is in the business of transforming evil. I go back real quick to what I said, that God doesn't cause evil, even though sometimes we, 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 um, we lay it at his doorstep and we blame him for it. But because God doesn't, doesn't create evil, because God abhors evil, he hates evil, he is not going to let evil stand. I tell people this all the time, that God will not let an account go unbalanced. We might not ever see how he balances the accounts of good and evil, but rest assured, there will come a day. If somebody has wronged you, I guarantee you, God will make it right. Somebody steals $100 from you, Joe, God might not put $100 in your wallet, but the guy that stole it from you, God will make it right with him. It will happen, I promise you. So now back to, to Joseph, back to the story of Joseph. I want you to look at this story as a story of transformation and forgiveness. Friends, I'm going to tell you, right from the very start, Joseph was getting a raw deal. I mean, if you can't count on your family, even as obnoxious as Joseph might have been to them, to be there with you, what kind of a family is it? So he got a raw deal from his brothers. He got a raw deal from Potiphar and his family. He got a raw deal when he was down in prison. My friends, it's almost unimaginable that we could have suffered through what Joseph suffered through and not come out on the other side angry and bitter. And if the story of Genesis had ended any different, I, I can't say that I would have blamed him. If, if Joseph could have remained bitter throughout his whole ordeal and said, you know what, this just ain't right. I, I'm not going to stand for it. Instead, God was able to use Joseph's trials to save him and an entire nation. The nation of Israel was saved through these trials. And not only the nation of Israel, but Egypt and all the people around him. For this is what happened. When he was down in prison, and the cupbearer, a couple of years later, heard Pharaoh's talking, saying, you know what, I had a couple of disturbing dreams. I wasn't even able to sleep. And none of the people in my kingdom can tell me what these two dreams mean. The cupbearer's like, oh, man, Pharaoh, I... I'm sorry, but I forgot to mention this guy down in prison. I was supposed to remind you that he was there, and I forgot. But there's this Hebrew down in prison that he interpreted dreams, and he told me what my dream meant. He told me what the, 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 um, the other prisoner's dream meant, and they both come true. Maybe you can ask Joseph what your dreams mean. And so Pharaoh summons Joseph up, and he says, I've had these two dreams. One's with cows, where we got good, lean, or, uh, good um, meaty cows, healthy cows, and then some old stragglers here that look like they're about skin and bones. And the skin and bones ate up the good cows. And he said, and I had another dream where these wheat stalks full of wheat were swaying in the breeze. And there's these other ones that were sun parched and looked like we hadn't irrigated them at all, but they ate up the good wheat. What does it mean? And Joseph says, here's what it means. We're going to have seven years of good harvest, followed by seven years of famine. So here's what you do, Pharaoh. 
you gather up in the good years, you store it up, and then you release it back out in the lean years, and we'll get through this. And that's what they did. And so when the famine came, and it was affecting Joseph's family, they knew that there was wheat down in Egypt. And so they went to Egypt, and they were saved. You see, God had chosen the nation of Israel as the family through which he would work his promise of redemption. But if they died out due to starvation, how would that happen? So since Joseph was down in Egypt and Joseph was suffering at the hands of evil, God was working all of that to put him in a position where his wisdom and where God's divine intervention could play out and save an entire nation. Here's the thing. When we read today's story, we see that Joseph loved his enemies. He wept over how his brothers were feeling. Rightly so, his brothers were repentant. They were scared for their lives that after their father had died, now Joseph will take his chance for, for, uh, to exact revenge. And Joseph says, you're my brothers. I love you. And besides, you might have meant that for bad, but God turned that evil into good. My friends, when we are wronged, it is often on our nature to seek justice and to seek revenge. And like I've already stated, we're also prone to blame God, Satan, or others because it relieves us of taking action and responsibility for what has happened. Often in our lives, all we need to do is to wait patiently like Joseph did and allow God to work and to do what God does. And when the world turns evil, only God is able to transform that evil into good. Now, evil, destruction, and death, they surround us, my friends. Pick up the newspaper. Turn on the news. Listen to the cries of the oppressed. Here in the South, we continue to fight a civil war that was finished over 150 years ago. Here in the South, we continue to blame slavery for all of our societal ills. We lament our political differences, our spiritual differences, our economic differences, and we see enemies in everyone we meet. How much sweeter would life be if we instead loved our perceived enemies, loved the world around us, and trust that God can and will take every evil in this world and transform it for the good of his people and for all of creation. I charge you with this, my friends. As Christians, you represent the best of what, can, what God can and will accomplish in this world. May you live up to it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple of things uh, for announcements. We are in charge conference season. So that means we've got some paperwork that needs to be done. Our charge secretary is getting notices out to folks that have stuff that needs to be done. One of the things that we need to do is set leadership for the upcoming year, which is a little difficult to do in the unprecedented times we find ourselves in. Um, I'll be reaching out to the nominating committees of all three churches here soon uh, to, to see about getting that process underway. Hopefully we can get it done in about a week or so, which brings me to my second point. Uh, the churches will need to have administrative council meetings within the next couple of weeks to finalize issues for charge conference. And my friends, as much fun as I'm having standing up here every Sunday morning and as beautiful as it is out here, I have heard from many of you the desire to get back inside the church building. I feel that desire myself. And I think it is time we start talking about what that might look like in getting a plan together. Because as dear Miss Rose and I, let's see, there's Miss Rose. Miss Rose and I were talking uh, the other night ago and she says, well, Pastor, pretty soon it's going to be cold out there. And we don't want to wait until the last minute to have a plan. 
So the administrative council, I'm asking if um, if we can have a meeting within uh, probably in about two weeks um, from all the churches to where we can talk about uh, transitioning back safely inside the building and what that might look like and, and to get that underway. All right. Uh, the last announcement, uh, it kind of pains my heart. Those of you from North heard it on the call out last night. Uh, Miss Ann Ferry has asked for prayer for her granddaughter, Brooke. We all know Brooke. Um, she has, for the last almost two weeks, been suffering with debilitating headaches. Um, they thought she was having a stroke. She has uh, she's been exhibiting stroke-like symptoms. They don't have all the answers yet, but they have an idea what it might be. But she continues almost daily to have these headaches and uh, have to go to the hospital. So they're asking for prayer for Brooke, uh, for, for Brooke's family, Miss Ann's family, as well as for the doctor. Uh, and all the health professionals that will hopefully try to get her some relief. Are there any other announcements uh, for the churches from you folks? Oh, yes, the Epworth thing. In your bulletins you uh, this morning, you'll find a, um, a uh, Epworth Workday offering envelope. Uh, I know we didn't have a lot of chance to emphasize it this year. Uh, they are still in dire need. Um, as, as a Christian pastor, um, I'm just going to be blunt with you. Don't ever rely on the government to do anything for you that you can do yourself as Christians. Epworth uh, Children's Home has been supported by the United Methodist Church, uh, by churches such as ours, for well over 100 years. Um, in recent years, they had come to rely on government grants for uh, uh, placements of children from the foster care system into their care. Um, the state government and the federal government has since decided that separation of church and state means that they uh, should not be giving state money to Epworth, and so they rely on us more than ever. Um, we make up about 40% of their operating budget, and that number continues to grow as they continue to lose government support. So don't rely on the government. Don't let them rely on the government. We need to step up. Um, I've already made a generous donation. Um, I ask that you can prayerfully consider making a generous donation. Uh, we take up, I almost said three, two collections a year, Mother's Day offering and a Workday offering, and it, it means a great deal to those children up there. That's all I got. Anything else, folks? Why don't you tell them how you do it online? <laughs> <laughs> they can figure that out. <laughs> Pearson, did you have somebody you wanted to tell us? You had your hand up. <laughs> okay Pearson wants y'all to know that him and Whitley are going to go play at the house is that what you wanted us to know all right there it is all right my dear friends God's transforming love can always turn evil into good and his transforming love flows like a river of glorious so let us lift our voices today and sing our closing hymn like a river glorious <laughs>
My dear friends, we cannot escape this side of heaven, the realities of evil and tragedy in our lives. There will be people that will take advantage of us. And I think I'm probably true in saying that we will take advantage of people as well. Forgiveness and allowing God to turn evil into good is the only thing that separates us from the rest of the world around us. Keep that in your heart as you go out to share that story this week with everyone you meet. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Hey folks, remember to click the subscribe button below and ring the bell to be notified when we post new content. And as always, if today's video touched you in some way, please hit the thumbs up button and leave us a comment. We love to hear how our content impacts your walk with Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless.